based upon this book about the Rebbe's life and developing a positivity bias. Um, and the classes, um, you could, the first two classes, if you want to catch up on those, you can find on YouTube and on Facebook. But either way, you don't need to know the first two classes in order to appreciate this class. Um, so until now, we spoke about the first week, we spoke about how every experience that we experience is, is divine providence. And we are meant to go through whichever experience we go through. Um, we and we talked about finding the positive in that. And there's no, in, in a certain way, there's no such thing as a negative experience. Um, then we spoke about developing a bias. We spoke about what a bias is and that the main framework what we need to do is instead of trying to change things which we don't have control on, rather we should change our bias, um, our framework, our perspective of how we see things, the glasses that we wear. And uh, we brought a number of examples uh, and stories from the Rebbe um, to show us about developing a positivity bias and in a certain way we spoke about experiences and how we feel feel and naturally it's automatically that we're going to first focus on the negative experience then rather focusing on the positive and um, it's a choice that we make and it's something that we have to develop and work on an effort to always be able to 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 look with a positive bias so this week we're going to speak more about interpersonal connections with that to, we'll start off with a story and welcome Mark. A young rabbi begins working in a new congregation. And what does he do as a, a most rabbis need to do? As they say, you, um, you brisk them, you bar mitzvah them, you wed them, and then you bury them. That's a rabbi's job, right? So... He, go, he has to go to a funeral. He has to, um, he has to um, do a tender, he has to lead a funeral for a man that he's never met. So he gets up and he says, he asks the congregation, is there anyone in the crowd that would like perhaps to say a few words, um, a, a final words, some good words about the deceased? And the whole crowd is silent. No one says a word. So the rabbi says, well, we can't proceed until someone can get up and say something positive about the deceased. So after a long pause, a member of the congregation gets up and he says, his brother was even worse. That was so, good. <laughs> he said something positive. Right. So we have a, uh, a beautiful section in Mishnah, in the oral teachings of our sages, is the section of Pirkei Avot, of the, the Pirkei Avot, the ethics of our fathers, which is a, an awesome work of development, uh, character development, of developing good characteristics. And there there's a Mishnah that says, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was a great Talmudic sage and a leader and had many students, and particular the Pika Avot said he had five star students, and it goes through each one of them. And it says in the Mishnah that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai tasked his students to go out into the world and find and discover the best advice to live to the, what is the best advice, the best character trait that a person should develop in order to fulfill, to live a righteous, fulfilling life. And each one came back with a different trait. Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkinus came back and he says, I've searched and I found the best advice is the best character trait that someone should develop is ayin tova, which means to develop a good eye. In other words, 
And he says, when your eye, when your lens to life is good, what you will see is good, no matter what. And of course, the opposite is also true that, um, and therefore, like we've been speaking in this class, it's a class is, it's uh, the utmost importance to develop the capacity to have a good eye, to see goodness, to see godliness in everything. And that's the essence of a good eye. That um, to see the world in such a way that every interaction, every event, every experience, you're going to judge it with a good eye, with a positive interpretation. And that was we were speaking about. And by the way, every human being has this capacity to see, to have a vision with like that, but to Achieve it is effort. So to understand this point of, and that's what we're dealing with tonight. Tonight's title of tonight's class is developing a good eye. So to, to illustrate this point, there is a story which is a powerful example of it. A disciple of a, a Hasidic community. You know, there was different Hasidic communities, not just Chabad, especially in the early days in Brooklyn. And a certain individual from a neighboring Hasidic community came to the Rebbe asking him a blessing. And after the personal discussion that he had with the Rebbe, the Hasid asked a question to the Rebbe. The Rebbe said, that the Talmud at the end of Tractate Chagiga says that Afilu Poshe Yisrael, that even the sinners of Israel are filled with good deeds, and this part you'll be familiar with, as pomegranates are filled with seeds. Right? And that's where we, that's that from that statement we get the idea that pomegranates. Why we eat on Rosh Hashanah, I have 613 seeds, etc. etc. But he asks a good question to the Rebbe. The statement says that even the sinners of Israel have deeds, have good deeds, are filled with good deeds as pomegranates are filled with seeds. This so the Chassid asked the Rebbe that that statement is contradictory, it's self contradictory. Because if someone is a sinner of Israel, as the Talmud calls it, then how could the Talmud say that he's filled with good deeds? That's contradictory. So the Rebbe nodded. He actually began quietly crying. And the Rebbe said, I have a same question. I have a I have a question on that very same passage. My question is: If Jews, if a Jew who we speak of is full of good deeds, how can he be called a sinner of Israel? So. That is a classic example of two individuals looking at the identical text, but seeing it from a vastly different approach. And what became clear in that story, that we're not just talking about the individual, the Jew under discussion, but also the state of mind. But look at that. Each one chooses to focus their attention on the negative or the positive aspect. 
And as we spoke previously, that we are, it's inescapable to, to, um, to have, not have bias, right? That we spoke before, because bias is, comes from all different things. The question is, what is my bias when I judge others or even myself? Am I actually looking at the positive or the opposite? And that's, in a sense, this idea, this trait that the Mishnah is speaking about to develop a good eye. And I in Tov, to develop a good eye is very particular benefit when we talk about interrelationships, when we talk about our personal relationships, whether it be our relationships with colleagues at work, with our family, with our community, because all relationships, all per interpersonal relationships are complicated. They can get messy because we're talking about two individuals. And therefore everyone has their different views, their different definitions, their different way of associations, their different narratives, their different way of choosing words, their different insecurities, their different projections, their perspective. And therefore, whenever you have two individuals where you, you going to have, it's gonna be messy. And like we spoke about before, besides, besides for that, each one unconsciously brings with them previous encounters and we carry over previous residue of angst, of resentment. And therefore, in any conversation between two individuals, there is possibility for misappropriation of the meaning of things that we say, the intent of what we say, of the a possibility of being skeptic of suspicion of others and easily easily we can fall back into our default mode which we spoke about last week which is the natural mode that we all easily do in what in not just seeing the event as negative but seeing the negative and seeing the worst in another person Now imagine if our daily encounters, we would be able to develop a good eye and condition ourselves to be more generous when judging others, when viewing others. Imagine a world where when we look at other people, we automatically give them the benefit of the doubt. And how much that would bring out the inherent kindness and develop the mutual kindness and respect that we all have for each other. And why I mean that, and going back to the point how each individual will always see things different. Let me show you an exercise that he brings in the book. It's a well-known optical, it's a well-known illusion. It's called the postcard of post, a German postcard from 1888. Let me bring it up. Okay. All right, everyone see the screen? Yep. Yes. Okay, now you could, we could discuss it um, or you could put it in the chat. What do you see in the screen? Do you see a young woman or an old woman? 
A young woman. And you see a young woman. I see both because her ear can also be an eye. I, th I think. Am I wrong? <laughs> no wrong answer. Okay. Who else? I see the profile. Of oh. Both. You see both. Yeah. Mark? I'm sorry. I just see the young woman. You know, I think that. <laughs> it's interesting. I couldn't. I also. I'm sitting with my was with my wife when I was preparing this class. I also only see a white young woman. My wife said you can see both. Ruth is saying you can see both. Ata Naomi say you can see both, and Mark you say you can see both. And the answer is that yes, there is. It's an optical illusion. And the way Ruth explained it, I can't see the second way. So Ruth can explain how you can see an old woman. I think it's her, her ear. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, you can see, look, look at the bottom of the, of the young woman's neck. That's the old woman's chin. And, right. Then, and then right above her neck where she's wearing that, uh, I don't know, choke, choke holder or whatever, what's it called? Choker. That's her mouth. And then the woman's, and then the young woman's uh, um, ear is the old woman's eye. I see it now. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's old woman is like almost like a witch, like a hag. Right, yes. right, a witchy old woman. Yes. Exactly. So, I don't get it. Where do you see the eye and the ear? Look at the. Um, Look at the young woman's ear, and that is yeah. that is the old woman's eye, and then um, the chin. Her chin is the old woman's nose, and then right below the nose, you see where the where the choker is. Yeah, that's her mouth. It's the old woman's mouth, and below that is her chin. <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> the profile. <laughs> Charles, I'm with you, but you don't see it. How do you not see it? It's her eye, her nose, chin. She's looking this way. You see it? No, she doesn't looking matter. Straight. She's looking straight, Charles. Oh, you see it. Now? Do you do you know what's helpful is if you put your finger over her bonnet. I think it's I think the bonnet kind of throws you off a little bit. The bonnet. Uh, I still I, the bonnet, I mean, I could have said as an older woman, but it doesn't matter. Carry on. I, 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 well, re, this is a, an illusion from the, the, the scientists, researchers found that they did an um, experiment with a, a lot of people that the social standing and experience of the subjects predicting which uh, image they saw first was the, uh, what they saw first, the young or old. In other words, the way they saw things directly impacted who they saw in that picture. That's what they concluded. which shows us that what we, the, 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 the eye or the color that we expect to see in others is in a way what contributes to the, the way we see things. Another, another uh, uh, interesting um, thing that came out as well recently, you know, on Facebook, with those that are familiar with the Facebook posts, there's a, a group called Humans of New York. It, it became viral, uh, Humans of Every City, where basically they took uh, pictures of individuals and gave a story of them. Anyone familiar with that? No. Yes. 
Okay, so they there's this picture. Okay. You see those two individuals on the bench? So read this caption. We are eye doctors. What's something about the eye that most people don't realize is that the eye doesn't see. The brain sees. The eye just transmits. So what we see isn't only determined by what comes through the eyes. What we see is affected by our memories, our feelings, and by what we have seen before. In other words, what are we saying? We're saying exactly what we've been saying in these classes, is what we see is directly affected by our default lens or bias, for better or for worse. And that's why Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus was saying that the most important characteristic that one needs to develop in life is a good eye. Because the essence of developing that trait is the foundation to having a positivity bias in our interpersonal relations. Which also, by the way, is very much based upon a very fundamental teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement taught. Many of you may know this teaching, that what you see in others is inside of yourself, is a mirror of yourself. The Baal Shem Tov would say that. In other words, when you see something wrong in others, it's in a way you see something that's wrong in yourself. And the opposite is true. Therefore, in other words, the more you condition to look for good, developing a good eye, the more we condition ourselves to developing, to see good in others, you know what the result of that will be? The more good you'll see in others. So the good news is, is that it's possible. We can rewire our neurological pathways and shift our patterns and perception to focus on the positive in others like we spoke last week. And with practice, we can reconfigure the uh, fundamental way in which we approach our interpersonal connections and it can lead to us developing an interpersonal positivity bias, which will thereby allow us to have relationships with a lot more understanding a lot more empathy and a lot more trust. And we, everyone has the ability. So let's go to this story where the Rebbe looked past outer appearances or expressions in negativity and saw the potential, that spiritual potential that was hidden in the, within a person. So this story happened almost two decades ago. A certain individual named Lady Yitzhak Freyden. Many of the pictures, a lot of pictures that you see of the Rebbe has his name because he was a photographer and he used to visit 770 a lot and the Rebbe allowed him to take pictures. 
So a lot of the pictures that we have of the Rebbe today is with the, from the pictures that he took. And um, he, he used to take beautiful pictures of the moments that happened in 770, whether the Rebbe go into the weekday prayers, fabrengings, events, dollars, the dollars, etc. In 1976, he made an exhibit at the Tel Aviv's Journalist Center, Beit Sakhalov. In at Barilan University, and the exhibit was of these pictures, and in a way, it gave the the this exhibit gave away for unaffiliated secular Jews the first uh, experience that they could see the Rebbe and the way Hasidic life was, the joyous spiritual life Hasidic life was. The exhibit was very well received. People were very intrigued and was, it was very well received. However, one journalist wrote in the guest book the following comment. He wrote, with all due respect to the superb photography, the subject you have chosen, chosen is extremely clerical and takes us back to the primitive darkness of the Middle Ages. That was the comment. Friedan later related that during his next visit to the States, he presented the Rebbe with the guest book of everyone's comment. And the Rebbe leafed through it quickly. And the Rebbe noticed this comment, this negative comment. And the Rebbe said to Frieden, the photographer, please compliment this journalist for his strength of character. It takes fortitude to differ from all the other responses. And the Rebbe then concluded with a further positive spin and says, but tell him also that not everything in the Middle Ages was dark. So in other words, a beautiful example on how the Rebbe was able to look past. The Rebbe was able to look for the positive, even in this negative reporter as well as even on the Middle Ages, which for many, in many respects, was not a pleasant decade for many people. Another beautiful example of the Rebbe's being able to see the, the light, the positive light, is in this story. Another political maneuver. The Rebbe founded an organization, and in those days it was very much a big threat. It's, thank God it's not as a big as of as of a big threat. It's still a threat, but it's not as of a big threat as it was. And that was the Christian um, Christian uh, missionaries and fringe uh, cults that used to try and come and, uh, and, and um, recruit Jews. So the Rebbe established anonymously a foundation um, to, to help uh, fight off these, uh, bust these cults and these Christian ministries, but he did it anonymously because he wanted support for this organization from all orthodox circles and therefore he didn't want it to be an only a chabad project he wanted to get as much support as he could so he therefore did it not under his name it became known that the rebel was involved in the organization and one of the leaders of the organization who was an orthodox jew but he was antagonistic to chabad as soon as he found out, 
he immediately removed his name from the organization and went uh, and went ahead and made his own organization, a new organization on the same kind of lines and started to get support from the original donors for the, from that organization. So the original organization's manager, a non Lubavitcher, a non Chabadness, was appalled by this man's uh, behavior. How, how petty, politically motivated uh, action and he went and confronted him. And even though it was clearly that his motivation was because he was anti-Chabad and anti the Rebbe, he, he denied it all. He, he denied that that was his motivation for making a new organization. So this man was very frustrated and delusioned by the whole thing. So he decided to go and speak to the Rebbe about it and tell the Rebbe the whole story. And he then questioned the Rebbe and he said to the Rebbe, how could it be that this rabbi puts politics before principles? So the Rebbe responded to him with a discussion from the Talmud. We actually, brought, we had this discussion in a, one of our classes. And the Talmud discusses that, you know, the Beis Din, the court of Jewish law, um, would establish every year, be, you know, this was prior to the calendars, the set calendars, they would establish the month of the year. And they would establish whether this year would be a leap year, in other words, have 13 months or 12 months. And they would bring witnesses to who saw the moon and it says and people would sit on that court deciding whether this year will be 12 months or 13 months and the talmud says that a king a jewish king and the kohen gadol and the high priest were not allowed to sit on that panel we're not allowed to sit on that court to decide whether the the year will be 12 months or 13 why? Why weren't they allowed to? So the Talmud says, because the king had a vested interest in making the year 13 months as opposed to 12 months. Why? Because his duty, the where would they pay the soldiers? From the king's treasure. And therefore, he would have to pay the soldiers wages for the year, which means that if it's 13 months, the treasury gains. And similarly, the high priest also had a vested interest in making the year 13 months. Why? Because we know the high priest was the only one to do the service on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement in the temple. And we know on the Day of the Temple on Yom Kippur, he would go into the mikveh he would immerse himself in, a, in a, a pool of water, which was outside, five times on Yom Kippur. Now, these were the days before modern heating. So it might be that he would be impartial on how they set the calendar because of the way he would comfort on when Yom Kippur, because if it would be 13 months, Yom Kippur would be late, it would be early in the season. Right, so therefore it wasn't, the waters wouldn't be that cold. So he had invested interest. What does that show us, the Rebbe says? That shows us, the Rebbe says, is human nature. That we all subconsciously, when we calculate things, have self-interest. And whether we know it or not, that comes into our calculations. And the Rebbe points out that the Talmud says that they even brought this into, when it came to into calculation, even with the Jewish king and the high priest. Which in other words, you're talking about the Kohen Gadol, right? You're talking about the holiest Jew alive 
or the Jewish king that was that was nominated. And yet the Talmud was uh, suspected that perhaps, I mean, you're talking about uh, setting the whole year, and yet he may not feel comfortable being going into the mikvah on her petty thing like on that because his toes might be a little bit more cooler. We worried about that. Or the king is worried about fine, uh, uh, paying an extra month of, of, of salary. And it's not that we suspected that they will. The Rebbe is saying that even the king and the Kohen God subconsciously might make that because there's that self-interest in mind. And the Rebbe then concluded to this man that you have to remember this man, this rabbi, He's a man, uh, uh, this is, a, uh, is um, this, uh, the, man, the rabbi he was judging for his conduct, conduct was a leader of a large community and a yeshiva in Europe back in the day, which was completely wiped out during the Holocaust. And now he's trying to establish a yeshiva here in New York for which he's dependent upon donors. And some of those donors, the Rebbe says, are ideologically opposed to Lubavitch. And the Rebbe said that's all he has. That's his everything. So can you blame him for wanting to ensure the success of, this, of his important work and legacy at all costs? In other words, the rebel was able to look past the negative and find something justifying to this man's actions. And yeah, because look, this was a personal thing to the rebel's own integrity. He has a rabbinic leader that's engaging in petty politics against him, he should have been, been more integral. He should have had been more, had more integrity. And yet the Rebbe was able to see a positive viewpoint in, the, in this rabbi's tactics. That what? That he was just trying to, 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 to have the remnants of his community by acknowledging and citing a Talmudic discussion that assumes the same when it comes to the most honored positions like the Kohen Gadol and the high priest. And this was in a case that negatively impacted the Rebbe, right? That for his own organization, but the Rebbe was able to manage to see a positive and redemptive way to view this man's position, even though it undermined the Rebbe's own work. So that's the I that we're talking about when it comes to seeing relations with others. And now a final point to consider this is very important. This point is very important when it comes to education, when it comes to dealing with young people as parents, as well as very important when it comes to dealing with relations, especially in spousal relationships. And that point is that time and again, the Rebbe taught us that I am Tova, that what we see in others, the way we look at others, not only does it affect how we see the other, but it also affects how the other sees themselves. In other words, when we see positive in others, we actually bring out we reveal those positive aspects of the others. 
we enable the other other to 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 capitalize on that strength and to overcome that whatever weakness or flaw they may have and especially when we express that positive that we see in which the other may not see and therefore just focus on his own flaws and negativity in other words it's not just affecting ourselves when we see the other positive but when we see the other positive and we express that to the other it affects him it brings out that positive which could be there but not revealed but not overly revealed and maybe a bit hidden but just took someone like you and perhaps this whole encounter going back to lesson one perhaps that whole encounter for you to to have the interaction together was for you to bring out that that positive experience that positive strength which was there but was just hidden and a beautiful example of that is this following story and there's this um there is um a video of it of the person himself i actually know the person he lives here in valley village um he's a father of uh some wonderful children and this is a story from his youth um let me get the story production is made Verschiedene Sachen sind nur auf dem Wort von dem Balschenten. Die Sieger hatten alles Treffels, jeder ihn gefragt, wer die Gleichen zu alles Treffels zu uns. Hallo. Wir estimieren das. Das ist schwierig. Das ist eigentlich die Geschichte, die wir gesprochen haben. Das ist die Geschichte, die wir gesprochen haben. I suddenly realized the rebel was challenging me to go and leave. Okay, from here. The rebel taught me something very important. That the most transformative moments in your life happen when somebody else believes in you more than you believe in yourself. The unterschied in our sido by in a was a gefühle sach kore zu dem eberflag the lele dafra pisela grobto gefühle gleich dem heaven table gefühle gleich dem mein chaim sido a seine was mit da grob tiefer und noch tiefer gde a rob zu ne mit a lignoni am barimi mo mastil I was at uh, Torres Chaim, which was on Belmont Avenue in Brooklyn. Shortly before my uh, 10th birthday, my mother uh, and my baby sister and myself went to see the Rebbe. Uh, we went to 770 and my mother started to talk to the Rebbe. My son, uh, Shalom, uh, he, uh, he's been thrown out of the yeshivas and the he says this and he's not listening and the rabbis are complaining he doesn't like the school he doesn't like the homework he doesn't like the program he likes eating stuff in class and then my mother's crying and crying because she's searching she was searching for answers the rebbe turns to me and then he smiles and he goes come here so i started the conversation because i was ready i, I said to the rebbe you're the rebbe So the rebel looks at me with a big smile. He says to me three questions. The first question was, uh, are you a good boy? I said, no, the conviction. I was ready, ready. I was used to the same. So then he says, uh, you like school? I said, no. Oh. Then he says to me, uh, do you listen to your mother? I said, no. So with a big smile, he turns to my mother and he goes, ah, Emmis, Emmis, it's good. At Uvdik 
There you have it. That's the teaching. Because look at that. You have your, a kid. And he's the rebellious type. And he's looking for a good fight. <laughs> the way he, you could see the, his spirit. He was looking for the fight. And how the Rebbe maneuvered that. The Rebbe was able to all of a sudden, when he pointed out the innocence, the, the, the truth behind the whole Torah, all that resistance just melted away in the kid. And the Rebbe, because the Rebbe realized what? That in essence, what are we made of? We are made of the godliness. Right, the divine soul, that divine spirit that's within us. In other words, the Rebbe was able to look past what the buildups and find the inner truths. So that's the exercise. That's the, the, the development that we need to be able to really work upon. And that's the, so that, that's how do we bring this into practice? So it gives you some suggestions. And that is, and again, this is, you can write down, you don't have to do it now, but it's a takeaway for the class. Think of someone in your own life that you're having a hard time with. And write down for yourself how they're acting, what they're doing that bothers you, that disturbs you. And then think of, what is, what could be a possible reason that they may be acting as they are, the way they are? And then ask yourself, can you look past that facade of arrogance, of ego, of self-absorption, and see a wholesome essence, which is in need of care, of nurturing, And then keep in mind and remember, if you change the way you look at people, the people you look at change. Okay, now let me finish off with this beautiful story. In 1960, an individual named Yale Butler, he was a son of a leading Orthodox family in Pittsburgh, and he had a good relationship with the Rabbi Yossi Spielman, who was a Lubavitcher rabbi. This young Yale 
who was a, quite an individualist. He was a very creative one, you know, his own character. And in seventh grade, he became the editor for the school's newspaper. And he wanted that the first edition come out with a splash. He wanted to attract, to get attention throughout the Pittsburgh community. So he thought of doing a spoof. So one of the most active figures in the Pittsburgh community was a Lubavitcher who used to wear a hat and jacket, but like his hat looked more like an army hat. And um, so he drew in and he had an untrimmed beard, which somehow reminded this young kid of Fidel Castro. And in fact, it, the, the association was so, uh, looked like, like that, that they used to call him Castro in the community. And we all know Fyodor Castro was anti-American, he's total, uh, he's to, uh, he, he dictated. To, to, um, and even though he wasn't really well known at that time to be such a dictator. So, he took this and he wrote a fictional account how there was an invasion in, of, of Cuba in which Castro's troops were in danger of being wiped out. In desperation, Castro called his brothers in 770. They contacted the Rebbe and the order, order was given. Hasidim were going to march on the Brooklyn Navy Yard and sail to go get Castro's rescue. That was the spoof he made. Now this kid's spoof did attract a lot of attention, but not the one that he really wanted because many people read his article and, very, and everyone was very upset about it. And even though it was out of jest, it was out of place, it was inappropriate. So the leaders of the Orthodox establishment reprimanded this 12 year old kid for his lack of sensitivity. And they told him that he needs to go apologize to the Lubavitch community. And the newspaper didn't make it. That was the first and last issue. So he went to this Rabbi Spielman and Rabbi Spielman didn't reprimand him. He said, you got to meet the Rebbe. So this young kid Yale was willing and Rabbi Spielman arranged the interview, the audience. So on one Sunday evening, this yell ca came in and the Rebbe motions to yell to sit down. And Rabbi Spielman leaves the office. And now this is the seventh grade kid sitting alone with the Rebbe, which is quite intimidating. And the Rebbe starts to speak to this yell very warmly and tell him about, ask him about his family and his work. And then the Rebbe starts complimenting him on his writings. And at that point, because until that point, he was just mesmerized with the Rebbe and the Rebbe's eyes, out of his terror, he noticed on the Rebbe's desk is a copy of this article <laughs> that he had written. And the Rebbe didn't make a mention of the article. He just, the Rebbe just complimented him on his writing skills. And then the Rebbe went on to tell him that it's a person's obligation that when he has a skill, when he has a talent, that he use it to benefit others. And in particular, the Rebbe said, that a writer has the ability to promote Jewish unity and love for one another. And Yell just, this kid froze and his fear turned into a feeling of empowerment because he has the Rebbe with this whole story. And instead of the Rebbe reproaching him, the Rebbe recognized in this kid 
that there's potential. And the Rebbe encouraged the kid to develop his potential and to develop it there be used for the positive and productive focus. In 1982, this kid became a rabbi and he also became the publisher of a newspaper called the B'nai Brief Messenger. And in the paper, he would every week bring a talk by the Rebbe as part of the Torah portion column. And one night, as he sat reviewing the list of people, because he used to have a free subscription, and then there was a, um, a subscription that uh, he, he, in order to, to pay for the newspaper, he made subscriptions that were uh, to pay for. And he noticed that one of the lifetime subscriptions was an individual named Rabbi M. M. Schneerson. That's the Rebbe's name. He had been sending the Rebbe a paper every week without any charge. But the Rebbe, look at what the Rebbe did. The Rebbe subscribed to his new newspaper on his own accord and paid for it with a personal check. With a personal, uh, with his own personal money. And years later, this in a conversation that yelled, now Rabbi um, Butler, in a conversation with someone else, the Rebbe noted to this other individual that this Rabbi has a good skill, a unique skill as a writer, and the Rabbi and the Rebbe says, since childhood. In other words, another classic story of how the Rebbe was able to see the, um, the facade of this youthful chaos and rebellion and bring about amazing accomplishment that just was waiting, waiting to, to uh, be brought about. So that, that's another beautiful example of how when we able to see good in others, then it changes that person to be good. All right. Yeah, any comments? Oh. No comments for me, thank you, Rabbi. Yeah, no.